Great. Um, so today I'll be presenting this paper called Exploring the Origins and Prevalence of Texture Bias in CNNs. Um, this is a collaboration between Catherine Herman from Stanford and Simon Cornbluth from Google Research Toronto. Um, and this paper builds on previous work by Robert Geros and his team that revealed that ImageNet trained CNNs are biased towards texture instead of shape. Um, so now what does that mean? It means that um, what they found was that if given an image with, like this with conflicting visual information, where you have the texture of an elephant, but the shape of a cat, CNNs trained on ImageNet have a tendency to make predictions based on texture rather than shape um, and tend to classify this image as an elephant instead of a cat. Whereas humans would normally say that the object in this image is a cat. Um, and this paper is essentially a collection of experiments that attempts to investigate what might be causing this bias. So before I start, um, I'm just gonna give a brief outline of my presentation. Um, first, I'm gonna discuss the implications of this texture bias a little bit further and why this could be problematic. Um, after that, I'm gonna go through the different experiments and results, and results presented in the paper. Um, the first experiment tries to look at the effects that the data set would have on the bias and whether CNNs are more likely to learn texture or shape. Um, next, they look at training objective and compare results between a supervised objective as a baseline and then compares them to three different unsupervised objectives. After that, they looked at um, different biases in, in model architectures from models that, perform, that showed state-of-the-art performances for ImageNet to architectures that are a bit more closely based on the primate brain. And then they look at the effects of pre-processing followed by the influences of, hyper of hyperparameters and more specifically learning rate and weight decay. And at the end, I'm gonna give a quick quick recap of the results and then do my best to answer any questions, should there be any. Okay. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the study by Robert Geras and his team had brought to light that this texture bias, had brought to light this texture bias in ImageNet CNNs. Um, these are results from that study to better illustrate the difference between texture and shape bias. On the left, you have a cropped image of elephant skin. In the middle, you have an image of a cat. And on the right, you have, the, you have a combination of the two where they used neural style transfer to overlay the texture of an elephant on the cat, creating an image with conflicting shape and texture information. And then um, when you look at the results at the bottom, you can see that the model correctly predicts the elephant on the left and the cat in the middle. But for the conflicting Q image, the model says it's an elephant with no mention of the cat at all for the top three predictions. Um, and this result is somewhat contrary to the widely held belief that CNNs mostly learn to recognize objects by looking at their shape rather than at their texture. Um, and I think if you'd asked most people, they would say that it's a cat rather than elephant. I'm referring to the image on the right here. Now, why does that matter and how could this be problematic? For one, this might be related to the vulnerability of CNNs to adversarial examples and allows for exploits that are not visible to the human eye, like you can see in this example here. First, you have a, first the model predicts a panda with 57.7% confidence, and then you add a bit of adversarial fuzz and then all of a sudden it thinks it's a gibbon with 99% confidence. Um, another thing to consider is that this bias might be more difficult might make it more difficult for machines to learn human relevant tasks, especially when it comes to tasks that don't have much, where there's not so much data available. Um, another thing is that CNNs are often used for modeling the primate visual cortex. And as such, this might mean that some research is going down the wrong path because um, a lot of the evidence points towards primates being shape biased. And ultimately, this raises the question if we're still comparing apples to apples when we are comparing human and machine vision, because they seem to be interpreting visual information in a very different way. 
So this is just a quick overview of the different factors that they investigate um, in order to find the source of this texture bias. Um, first, they look at a couple of different data sets. Then they look at the different, um, like I mentioned earlier, supervised and unsupervised objectives. Then they look at a bunch of different model architectures. Then they look at pre-processing, more specifically augmentation and what that might do to this texture bias or how that might cause the texture bias. And then they look at the hyperparameters, learning rate and weight decay. So the first question that they try to answer is, um, how does the data set influence texture or shape bias? And they do this by looking at the results from three different data sets, where each image in the data set has two labels, one for texture and one for, one for shape to tease out the given bias. Um, they trained both a, Red, a ResNet 50 and an AlexNet on this, and then trained it on either varying amounts of data, so 5%, then 10%, and then increments of 10% until you hit the full amount of the data, um, and then try to figure out whether this model would predict the texture label or the shape label. So this is the first data set that they look at called the Gearhouse style transfer data set, which uses neural style transfer to create images like this. Um, all in all, this data set has 1200 images with 16 shape classes and 16 texture classes. So we already looked at the, we already saw the cat elephant example earlier, but on the right here, you have um, the shape of a car with a bottle texture. And then, like I said, you try to see which of the two the model will end up predicting. The next data set is called the Navan data set, which consists of 3,250 images like this, where you have um, the shape being the big letters and the texture being the big letters con consisting of many smaller le letters, which are supposed to be the texture in this case. And this data set was originally created by a psychologist in the 1970s called David Navin, or Navan, I don't know how to pronounce that, um, to study how humans process global versus local information and found that humans process shape more readily than texture. Um, so yeah, there's, there's 3,250 images, um, 26 by 26 different combination, one for each letter in the alpha, alphabet. And then um, they drew, uh, they, they rotated the, the images, uh, they rotated letters um, with an angle drawn between 45, between negative 45 and 45 degrees. Next, we have uh, the ImageNet C data set, which is a variation of ImageNet with different types of noise applied to the image. So there's 19 different noise textures with five different levels of intensity. Um, and then they subsampled five different data set versions from this, um, resulting in each data set having 90,250 images per version to balance shape and texture classes. And these are the results. Um, so the blue line represents the shape accuracy. And the orange line displays the texture accuracy. And then in the top row, you have the, um, the experiments on different amounts of training data. And then on the bottom row, you have the experiments run on uh, different amounts of training duration from zero to 90 epochs. Um, and then what they found was that both models learned shape just as readily as texture. But um, overall, the AlexNet model needs a bit, less later, a bit less data to achieve high accuracy on shape than on texture, um, which is more, even more pronounced for the Gearhouse style transfer data set over here and over here. But you still see it here as well. Um, and for the AlexNet, the shape accuracy arises a bit faster as well than the texture accuracy. Another thing you can observe here is that when you look at the ImageNet results, you see a fairly clear texture bias because the texture accuracy is higher than the shape accuracy for both the ResNet and the AlexNet. 
Um, and then another thing to keep in mind here is that the accuracy for the for the ImageNet data set bumps up pretty fast because five percent of um, because five percent of training data is already a lot when you're looking at ImageNet data sets when compared to the other two data sets. So that's why you have a pretty high accuracy over here already. Um, so yeah, that's this part. Um, so the next thing they, the next question they try to answer is how shape and texture are represented within the ImageNet models. And um, they try to figure out if the model knows about shape, even though it's talking about texture. That's, so the, the authors of the paper use a very good analogy here to explain their thinking. So what they say is that a fabric salesman might refer to this chair here as the velvet, even though the fabric salesman is fully aware of it still being a chair. Um, and they try to, what they do is they design a few very interesting experiments to see whether um, the model is referring to the image's texture, even though it knows about the shape. So what they did was take the intermediate layer outputs from an AlexNet and a ResNet and use those intermediate activations as inputs to train linear classifiers to either classify shape or texture of the, on the neural style transfer data set. So for the AlexNet, the, the layers they looked at are these last three here. They used the, they looked at this, this uh, layer that came out of the layer after the convolutional layers, um, including the max pool. So I'm guessing it's this one here. And then they looked at the two sub subsequent um, fully connected layers, um, this guy and this guy over here. And then for the ResNet, I didn't have enough space to put the whole thing here. They looked at the pre-pool and the post-pool layers, which is the, where the final layer. So the pre-pool layer is the, is the input to the average pool layer of the ResNet 50. And the post-pool layer is the output of the average pool layer, which is the layer that leads to the final output layer. Um, and the goal here is to, is to compare infer the different types of information represented at different depths of the respective models. And here are the results. Um, so what they found was that despite the high degree of texture bias, shape information still appears to be present in the models as they're still able to make predictions with more than 66% accuracy, especially in the earlier layers. But they also found that shape information is, um, but they also found that despite shape information being present in both models, it decreases later um, in the models, suggesting that the classif classification layers tend to remove shape information as, um, as it propagates through the model. So you can see here in the blue line, the shape accuracy for AlexNet starts going down and same for the ResNet, whereas the texture accuracy stays consistent across the layers. Okay. So the next thing they do is look at the training objective. And they compared the performance of um, supervi a supervised model as the baseline for these experiments with three unsupervised tasks to see how these tasks might influence the bias. Um, the first task is rotation classification where an input image is either not rotated at all, rotated 90 degrees, 180 degrees, or 270 degrees. And then the model has to guess which of the rotations was applied to the image. And um, the original authors of this experiment said that in order to do well, the model needs to understand which objects are present in the image along with location, pose, and other semantic characteristics. And, um, if you think about it, the goal here is to encourage more shape bias in the model. The next experiment is called the exemplar experiment, where the goal is to learn representations where different augmentations of the same image are close in the embedding space. So what they did is they, they took 
they made eight copies of 512 data set examples using random crops from those images with a 66% chance of converting that image to a grayscale. Um, so, and then they applied triplet loss to reduce the distance between the images of the same sample and increase the distances between images in this space. I hope that made sense. Um, and just to elaborate, triplet loss is kind of um, similar to guessing the odd one out, where they give the model th three items, two of the same image and one of another image, and then the model has to guess which of the two belong together. And um, because of this cropping, one would kind of expect a higher texture bias from this, from this task. The third task is called the um, big bigan, which was an adversarial model where the, where you have a generator, an encoder, and a discriminator. Um, and the generator's task is to convert latent codes into images. And the encoder's task was to convert images into latent codes. And then these two are working together to try and fool the discriminator, which, um, where the discriminator's goal is to tell the difference between the sampled and actual latent representations and the representations generated by the generator. And um, for, for these tasks, they use the res, for the big bigan, they only use the ResNet as a backbone. And then for the other two tasks, they use both a ResNet and an AlexNet for these experiments. Okay, and these are the results. At the top, you have the results from the supervised model, um, followed by the rotation experiment, the exemplar experiment, and the big bigan experiment. Um, and then what you can, s the interesting thing here is that the models are all still a bit more texture biased than, um, than shape bias because all these results here fall below the 50% line. However, as expected, um, the rotation task has the highest shape bias amongst them all with 47%, um, followed by the big bigan, which has a 31.9% shape bias. Hello? Sorry, is somebody trying to say something? Okay, okay. Anyways, I'll just go on. Um, so yeah, as I was saying, the big bigan has a higher shape bias than the supervised version of the model. Um, another thing that was kind of as expected was that the shape accurate, whoops, was that the shape accuracy for the exemplar model, which is kind of, the task was kind of engineered to create more of a texture bias did the, perform the poorest for um, shape accuracy and had the highest texture accuracy amongst all the models. Um, and then aside from that, uh, none of the supervised, uh, none of the non-supervised models outperformed the, um, outperformed the supervised models, but the big bigan did the best in terms of top 1%, top one accuracy. So in summary, both um, architecture and task have an effect on shape bias. But, and another thing to, that you can see here is that these results also suggest that architecture and tasks appear to be independent influences when it comes to where the source of the bias is. Okay. The next thing they looked at is the relationship between state-of-the-art models, um, ImageNet performance, and shape bias. And they found that shape bias um, and ImageNet accuracy and performance is positively correlated, which you can see here. Um, the best performing ImageNet models or state-of-the-art models had the highest level of shape bias. But still, one has to keep in mind that the shape bias for all these models is still below 30%. So all the models are still texture bias in a sense. 
Okay. The next thing they looked at was um, shape bias in more brain-like models. They looked at the publicly available Cornet models, which are models that are built more to mimic the actual primate brain. And there are three, there are three versions of this model, um, model Z, model R, and model S. Model Z was the simplest version of this model. Um, model R was the, is a bit more sophisticated than this model because it had uh, recurrent features to it. And then model S was the most brain-like model because um, it had the highest brain score, which was a measure of brain similarity. Um, and what they found and what was kind of surprising was that these models didn't exhibit that much more of a shape bias than other models that we looked at so far. Um, with the model, the more, most sophisticated model S model having even a lower shape bias than the, than the less sophisticated model R. Um, they also looked at another model suggest that was proposed by V.S. Ramachandran um, that used attention heads instead of convolutions. Um, but the, what they found here was that those models also performed fairly similar to the baseline. So all in all, even though these models are even are a bit more brain-like than the other um, convolution, the other CNN type models, um, they all still show a fairly significant texture bias. Okay, next thing they looked at was random, um, the effects of pre-processing. More specifically, they compared random cropping versus center cropping. Um, and for the random cropping, what they did was they, they cropped anything between 8% and uh, the full image and then sampled from an aspect ratio of either 0.75 or 0.33, and then resized them to 224 by 224 images. Um, and then they, they tested this amongst a range of models, an AlexNet, a VGG16, a ResNet50, and an Inception ResNet version two. And the results are kind of as expected here as well with a higher shape bias for the center cropped images because uh, random cropping the images would kind of make the model rely a bit more on texture than on shape information because the shape information kind of disappears when you zoom into certain parts of the image. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, the shape bias is higher for the center crop than the random crop. Um, the shape accuracy was also higher for the center crop model. But the direction of the texture accuracy kind of depended on the model because you have a higher texture accuracy for random cropping for the AlexNet and the VGG16 here, but a higher texture accuracy for the um, ResNet50 and the Inception ResNet V2 here. And um, you still have a higher overall accuracy from the random crops, which again points towards all these models being more texture biased. Okay, next question is um, how do hyperparameters hyper influence shape bias? Um, what they did is they conducted a grid search to see the effects of learning rate and weight decay. And what they find, found was that a higher learning rate and uh, weight decay resulted in high, higher shape accuracy and shape bias. Whereas the higher texture accuracy was associated with a lower learning rate. And overall, the mean per class accuracy was sensitive to the product between learning rate and, and weight decay. Should I see a mistake in my slides here. So it was, it was sensitive to the product between learning rate and weight decay, but not to what learning rate alone. Um, and yeah, that was all the experiments. Um, here, a quick recap of the results. Overall, the AlexNet had a higher shape bias than the ResNet50. Um, the data experiment results showed that even though models made texture bias classifications, the shape information was still present in the model and unlearned to an extent in later layers of the model. 
And um, what they also found here was that the models learned both shape and accuracy from the data. So the data is not that much of a factor here. The next thing they looked at was a training objective and found out that it does influence texture and shape bias, but none of the tasks exhibited a very strong shape bias. So, you know, the jury's still a bit out, the jury's still out here and it's not very conclusive. Um, lastly, they found that high performing ImageNet models display greater shape bias and accuracy, which kind of suggests that shape bias is still useful. Um, and could be something that can still be taken advantage of with you know, future, future models. Um, and one last thing to mention here was that most of these experiments, that there's a bit of a caveat because most of these experiments were run on the Giro style transfer data set, which itself was created using the, was created using ImageNet data. So that doesn't make the data completely independent of the models used to evaluate it. And, um, 